up guys so it's that time of the year again the time for me to look back and give you my top 10 movies of the year i only have one rule for a film to qualify for this list i have to have seen it simple as i've watched a lot of movies this year but i haven't watched all of the movies that 2022 had to offer i'm only one man but in all honesty 2022 wasn't the greatest year for cinema for me personally anyways like don't get me wrong we did have some absolute gems gonna talk about those those gems later in the video but generally this year did feel a little bit underwhelming it actually wasn't as hard for me to pick the top 10 movies of the year for me normally I have about 30 films I have to like whittle it down to this year there was about 18 so yes there was less truly amazing movies for me to pick and choose from. Side note, before we get started, I do actually have reviews for all the movies in my top 10 of the year. So if you want a more in-depth discussion about any of these movies, you can find the reviews on the channel. But for this video, I'm just gonna give you the cliff notes of why I loved all of these movies. So with number 10, I always find that this is the hardest slot to fill because it's like the last entry on a top 10 and you've got multiple films to choose from to give the last slot to. So you gotta think what film is blessed enough for me to give a slot in the top 10. And this year, it actually came down to two animated movies, funnily enough. And that's why I want to give an honorable mention to Joel Crawford's Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. That movie genuinely surprised me. I absolutely adored that film. Uh, I wish I could put it in the top 10 because it really was something special. So yeah, if this were a top 11, it would take my 11th spot. But at number 10, we have another animated movie. I mean, it's debatable. It's a mix of like animation, uh, CG, and live action. Uh, and it is about a charming little mollusk who charmed the world, really. <laughs> he certainly charmed his way into my heart and it's Dean Fleischer Camp's Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. Oh my days, I don't think I've been more smitten watching a film in 2022 more than I have with Marcel. This was a love at first sight type of movie. There are so many words I can use to describe this movie. It's sincere, earnest, wholesome, and imaginative. It's also very poignant and full of wisdom. I honestly don't know how anyone could watch this film and not be affected by it. The blend of stop motion, animation, live action, and CG is so seamless. And it's a film that is so clearly made with love, care, and passion. If you need a pick-me-up type of movie or a film to remind you of the good in humanity, check out Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. It is guaranteed to make you feel wonderful. Okay, so next up we have what is definitely a definitive film of 2022. And it's a film that I think we all initially shrugged off as another unnecessary cash grab slash legacy sequel, but actually ended up being one of the most lovingly made and jaw-dropping films of the year, and it is Joseph Kaczynski's Top Gun Maverick. I didn't even like the first Top Gun movie all that much, so I definitely didn't think this was gonna end up on my top 10 of the year when 2022 started. But my God, this is what going to the cinema is all about. What Top Gun Maverick actually managed to pull off is that sense of awe and wonderment that we so very rarely get in mainstream cinema nowadays. They didn't take the easy route with this film, like making it a CGI extravaganza, they took the time to do it the hard way, to do it the more impressive way, to get things in camera for real. Things that absolutely dropped our jaws to the floor. For that discipline to accomplish things for real, I gotta give Top Gun Maverick a slot in my top 10. We just don't get enough filmmakers like this going out of their way to give us something real, something tangible, something to make us go, wow. Next up, we have a late entry on this list. I was hoping I'd get to see this movie before 2022 was out, and thank God I did, because I absolutely adored this film. It is the latest outrageous film from Damien Chazelle, Babylon. Oh, the depravity. <laughs> A dazzling three-hour epic that both celebrates and criticizes Hollywood during the golden era through the transition of silent films into talkies taken to the absolute max. The antics of what goes down in this movie makes The Wolf of Wall Street look like The Wizard of Oz. It is a wild, hedonistic genre blend that constantly keeps you on your toes with superb turns from Raga Robbie, Brad Pitt, Diego Carva, a slaptastic soundtrack from Justin Hurwitz and dynamic direction from Damien Chazelle. Babylon is an audacious and you 
euphoric watch, which needs to be seen to be believed. It's in UK cinemas January 29th, and I encourage all of you to go watch it on the big screen as it was intended. Okay, so next up, we have a sequel which had zero business being as good as it was. It's Ryan Johnson's Glass Onion, A Knives Out Mystery. Here's the thing with Glass Onion. It's not a movie that is gonna change your life or has some profound message about society. Well, even though it is, I guess, uh, eat the rich satire, kind of. It's just a well-made, supremely enjoyable movie that is nothing but fun to watch at the cinema. Well, technically at home from Netflix. Not all movies need to change the world or the medium. They can just be a bloody good time to watch. And that's what I got with Glass Onion, a deliciously fun and entertaining whodunit, which totally lives up to the first film. Some people actually say Glass Onion is better than Knives Out. For me, I think the movies are on par with each other. Neither one is worse or better. They're just equally awesome. I have so much respect for Ryan Johnson because he refuses to play things safe. Like he could have just followed the formula of the first Knives Out movie and done the same thing again with a different cast. No, he took some risks with this one with the story and the structure and they all paid off tremendously. If you haven't seen Glass Onion, I highly recommend it. Check it out on Netflix, you can stream it there. And speaking of eat the rich satires, next up on the list, we have the delicious palm door winning Triangle of Sadness from Ruben Oslin. If you guys have been watching my channel for a while, you'll know that I love a social satire, so it's no surprise that Triangle of Sadness made it onto my top 10. Not only is it a bloody fun watch, it is a film for our times. A vicious dissection of the rich and the beautiful, taking jabs at white privilege, influencer culture, the fashion industry, gender roles. It is a bit of a gross out comedy in places, but it is side-splittingly funny and a very worthy Palme d'Or winner. And if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend taking it out. It is a film that will shock you and delight you. Okay, so next up we have another film that had its debut at this year's Cannes Film Festival, and this was the little indie movie that could. It's Charlotte Wells' spellbinding feature film debut, After Sun. Because After Sun really is a miraculous movie. I don't wanna to say too much about it, but it's a tender father-daughter drama set in the 90s on a holiday to Turkey. And the film is an achingly beautiful story about reflecting on the past to help us make sense of the now. Mental health struggles and memories. It is a miraculous debut from Charlotte Wells, one of the finest debuts I've ever seen. And if this is what she's doing right out of the gate, I cannot wait to see what she does next. And I'm also so excited to follow the careers of her two stars, Paul Mescal and Frankie Corio, who both deliver such beautifully nuanced and heartfelt performances. After Sun really is something special. If you haven't seen it and want to watch it, you can now stream it on Mubi, and you can actually watch it for free by signing up to a free 30-day trial membership at Mubi using the link that's in the video description and on the screen right now. Okay, so next up we have a film that really is a one of a kind. It's Luca Guadagnino's adaptation of Camille D'Angelis' novel, Bones and All. I honestly think there are only two filmmakers in the world that could have pulled off a film like Bones and All. One of them is Guillermo del Toro, but more on him shortly. And the other is Luca Guadagnino, who somehow marries the summer love sensibilities of Call Me By Your Name with the grotesque body horror of Suspiria. It's a genre blend which almost sounds impossible to pull off, but Luca Guadagnino makes it look so effortless, demonstrating his immense skill as a storyteller to Get a tone like this, just spot on. It's a film that makes me swoon over the romance, but also makes me go <laughs> with the, the horror elements of it all. Like those two things feel like they should clash, but somehow Warding, you know, melds them together. TBB Chalamet and Taylor Russell are probably my favorite on-screen romantic pairing of the year, which is insane to say because I'm literally watching a film where they're eating people. And I'm like, how? This should not work. And yet somehow it does. It's also one of those films that can be read and interpreted in so many different ways. And I love it when a film has layers of allegory and meaning. And it's unlike anything I've seen before. I'm trying to think of a movie that I can compare it to, and the closest thing is probably Julia DeCorno's Raw, but even that is in a category by itself. So yeah, this movie is kind of 
incomparable and that's what makes it special because I can't compare it to anything. I like that it exists in a box of its own but also doesn't fit into other boxes. It's definitely not a film for everybody, particularly if you're a bit squeamish, but I was surprised by just how much I ended up loving Bones and All. Next up we have my favourite animated film of 2022, which is from one of my favourite storytellers of all time, the aforementioned Guillermo del Toro, who brings beauty, darkness and whimsy to the overly adapted tale of Pinocchio. It's a story we've seen done a million times just this year. And just as we've seen before, nobody knows how to bring a fairy tale to life like Guillermo del Toro. Set to the backdrop of a rising fascist Italian regime, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio is probably the most adult version of the wooden puppet I think I've ever seen. It's very mature in its themes, but it's also a fun adventure for kids to enjoy with an absolutely gorgeous blend of stop motion animation and CG animation. It's just a match made in heaven of beloved auteur and beloved story. Next up we have a film which sadly flopped at the box office, but I genuinely believe will grow in appreciation as time goes on. It's Nicholas Stoller's gay rom-com Bros. I love this movie so much. I saw it three times at the cinema, once at TIFF, once at the London Film Festival, and once at the cinema because I wanted to go watch it with my boyfriend. A gay, love it, a gay rom-com. Groundbreaking. Well, yeah, in fact, that is very much what it is. It was groundbreaking. To see that kind of representation in a mainstream, lewd, romantic comedy in an actual cinema was something very special to me. And I can imagine for a lot of LGBTQ people, because we've not really seen it on the big screen before. A film where 99% of the cast identifies as being queer. Being in the audience for that very first screening of Bros at TIFF is something that I'll treasure forever. Because this shit actually matters, okay? This is progress. And I also loved how honest Bros was in depicting the gay experience, okay? It doesn't heteronormatize things for the straight people that might be watching the film, it actually dares to show all facets of our lives, the good, the bad, and the questionable. It actually shows the complexities and nuances of queer relationships and friendship dynamics. And it was genuinely hilarious from start to end. And for that, Billy Eichner deserves so much credit. I know it might not have been a runaway hit at the box office, but the quality is there, okay? It's evident in the end product. And I really do believe the film will find more of an audience on a streaming service someday. More people will watch it at home and fall in love with it. The word will spread and appreciation for this film will only get bigger. As is the way with many films, they may not be appreciated upon release, but as time goes by, more and more people fall in love with them. Before we get to number one, I do have some honorable mentions. I know I said 2022 has been a bit of a lackluster year, but there were still some Wonderful movies that I wanted to give a special shout out to. They include The Banshees of Inner Sharon, The Fablemans, The Woman King, The Inspection, RRR, Matilda the Musical, Tar, The Whale, Decision to Leave, Fall, Spirited, Nope, All Quiet on the Western Front, The Northman, Barbarian, Broker, Causeway, Dashcam, One Fine Morning, Lightyear, The Menu, Great Freedom, Weird, The Al Yankovic Story, Funny Pages, and Violent Night. All right, so we made it to number one, and you probably guessed what my favorite movie of 2022 is, because at this point, it's very basic and pedestrian to have this at number one, because it's so popular, and it's probably half of film Twitter's number one film of 2022. It is, of course, The Daniels, Everything Everywhere, All at Once. Yeah, it might be an obvious pick, but for good reason. Everything Everywhere was the movie of 2022. The little indie movie that could, which spread like wildfire thanks to the power of word of mouth hype and actually lived up to the hype. A totally original movie managed to make over $100 million worldwide, okay? That is something to celebrate. A, an original movie getting that many bums in seats, okay? Wow. And that's because it was a smart yet fun and accessible movie, which was a genre blend of sci-fi, fantasy, kung fu, action, family drama, adventure, and goofy comedy, uh, which still hit hard emotionally and spoke about the immigrant experience, as well as parental pressure and the universal existential dread which we feel in everyday life. Again, it's another film that just shouldn't work. It's like the Daniels threw every idea they had at the wall 
and remarkably, so much of it stuck. I love that it's a film that I can't fit into one specific box. I love that it fits into so many different boxes. This film also did wonders for its cast. It gave Michelle Yeoh the definitive role of her career. It reintroduced audiences to Kihi Kwan. It also introduced us to breakout star Stephanie Hsu. And it gave beloved actors like Jamie Lee Curtis and James Hong some of their most beloved work ever. It's a film that is gonna be discussed and analyzed for decades. And it's also the type of film that is gonna inspire future filmmakers as well. It is a movie that has clearly been made by movie lovers themselves and it is insane what they managed to pull off with a relatively low budget. So yeah, Everything Everywhere All At Once is a triumph in every sense of the word. We are so lucky to have this film and that's why it's my number one film of 2022. And there you have it guys, that was my top 10. But I do want to hear from you, what were your top 10 movies of 2022? Whatever they were, let me know in that comment section down below. If you want to follow me on any of my socials, Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, TikTok, it's all in that video description down below. What were your top 10 favorite movies of 2022? Pop them in the comment section below for me. Just want to give you all a big thank you for supporting and watching and commenting on my content that I made for this year. Plenty more coming in 2023, yeah, so stand by for that. Uh, please do help support the channel by hitting the little thumbs up button and if you haven't done so already, please do click subscribe, helps me out massively. And for more things related to movies, TV, the Oscars and popcorn culture, I'm Luke Airfield and I'll see you in 2023.